And I'm going to ask for new voices as well, if you don't mind. Great. Right, so let's, let's give uh, some time to people also who haven't heard their voice yet these past couple of days. Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for making us remember that we're not just data, we're people. Even though for the past few sessions we've been talking about algorithm and how the governments manipulate algorithms and all of that, and it made us almost forget that we're also human, we're not data, so we should always uh, remember that and maybe put that in the manifesto because this is basically all we're talking about. Second of all, when you were talking about the tragedy that's been going on, whether in the UK or in Europe, we should also remember the tragedy that's happening in the Middle East and also include that because if in developed countries this is still going on, imagine what is going on in underdeveloped countries where Gen Z and women and people who are don't have a say in what happens, are trying to push further narrative and the media, but then again, the government is the one that controls this, this narrative. So thank you very much for ba basically giving us hope to keep pushing and try as much as possible to make our voices heard, especially that we are trying. I mean, I can talk from experience, I'm Lebanese, and I'm a young woman, I'm 23, so almost nobody takes me seriously when I talk about female issues and politics, but then again, we tried by, fa by founding um, a media organization called Polyblog and co-producing three podcasts. You were talking about podcasts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you. Thank oh, you. brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Rita. I come from a small country named, uh, called uh, North Macedonia. I'm a journalist and TV presenter and a women's rights activist as well. Uh, my question is directed uh, to the Level Up uh, woman. Sorry, I didn't remember your name. Um, so I work uh, on violence against women a lot in my country, and um, I live in a more patriarchal society. So uh, I want to connect it with, with the last case, with uh, last week, uh, a video was shared uh, in the internet, and it went viral, where a young woman was abusing an older woman. Uh, and because I react a lot and I work against uh, violence uh, against women, but mostly when the um, abuser is a man, I was attacked. Why I'm not reacting when a woman is attacking another woman? Uh, and I, what I get from that is that um, men can't wait, uh, in my country especially, for a case where they can say, here, we are not the only abusers, Women are abusers as well. I want to get from you, uh, the question is, uh, have you had such um, feedback, if I can say it so, or reaction uh, towards what you have done um, with this? Because I work with journalists as well on how they should report. And uh, to be honest, um, we have problem with how they uh, how they understand uh, women's issue, especially uh, violence against uh, women. So, have you had a reaction towards you when you have been working on uh, creating this um, the, the manual? Thank you. Brief reply, Janie. Um, what from from men in particular? I think the one thing that does come up is um, not ever from journalists. There's been actually mostly a very warm reception from journalists who say, thank you for giving us tools. No one trained us on this. But we do hear from men on Twitter who will say, why don't you talk about men who are victims? Which is redundant because two of the people at the center of the campaign are Luke and Ryan Hart, who are two male victims of domestic violence. So that kind of question is very bad. There's very bad intentions. But when I do answer it, I say, yes, the majority of men who are murdered are murdered by other men. So why don't, why don't we talk about violence um, that happens between men? And why don't we talk about the roots of patriarchy? And what a, great, what, what a great thing to raise. Why don't you take on that issue? Thank you so much. Please. Hi, everyone. My name is Kurt Farouja. I'm Maltese. Um, first of all, thank you for all your presentation. It was very interesting. All of you have touched upon quite interesting topics. I have a question for Jamie. Um, um, I kind of disagree with you for, on the aspect when you said that you want to move away from advertising of plastic surgery. I have been myself, I have, to, I have been, I've worked in the industry for quite a while and I kind of disagree on, for the simple reason that 
I know what you're coming, where you're coming from, but I think it should, have, it should be that moving forward, professionals are giving the information on, on the media of how to go for, for the specific um, treatment, what for, because we've all come across people that have bruises that are only changed and reprimanded by plastic surgery only, like for example, blepharoplasty, the eyelids. So I really want to like open up the, the discussion for you to like explain to me why though the, to, to remove completely uh, plastic, plastic surgeries. Okay, so I think there might have been a misunderstanding because I'm not against plastic surgery in any way. It was the fact that those adverts were being marketed on, they were saying, you only need to be 16, you can use a payment plan, which gets young women into debt. Um, and it's okay. And they were being shown in um, the context of a TV show that only shows very, you know, it was the context. I agree with you completely. <laughs> Thank you. Liz. Our Brazilian friend. Can you grab a mic? <coughs> There you. Um, I think, as always, I I don't know if I'm the only Latina here, but I think I am. Um, and I would the thing that that stuck the most with me was when you said the crisis that we make, the crisis that we create, and when you show the fires um, in the Amazon rainforest. Brazil, um, when dealing with immigration, we had in the past year about thirty thousand people That's asking true. for asylum in Brazil and about 29,000 got the asylum with the passport in less than one month. But you don't see Latin America in the conversations about immigration and how we have dealt with immigration for the past 300 years in a very miscegenated society in which Im immigrants were quickly um, inserted inside those societies. Mm -hmm. What you do see is the problem of the Amazon rainforest, which I'm not saying at all, <laughs> it's not a problem. But um, what most people don't see is um, Brazilian companies cut down trees to plant soy. Soybean. If I go to the supermarket in my own country, I would never find Brazilian soybean mm -hmm. being sold. But I do find soybean in Europe. Yeah. So, but at the same time, this is a crisis that they created for us, and they won't talk about it. At the same time, 68% um, of Brazilian women will suffer from violence. A woman in Brazil dies every seven hours. We are the country that kills the most trans people in the world. The trans life expectancy in Brazil of trans women is 35 years. Um, we, we have such a violent country that do not understand women as people. And then I come to Europe, and what they tell me is, oh my God, you don't look Brazilian. What they, what they are thinking is, oh my God, she is white. But unconsciously, what they're thinking is she doesn't have a beach body, she doesn't have those assets that Brazilians normally have. She's not with the blonde hair, the plastic surgery, this unconscious feeling of sexualization of Latin American women in Europe. The word for a male prostitute in Italy is an offensive word in Portuguese. They just took the word that we say in Portuguese and incorporated, and they say that same word for male prostitutes in, in um, Italy. So this is not a crisis for them. The crisis is how we do with the environment, even though 90% of Brazilian energy is renewable, we do hydro energy. Mm. Um, so I, I really want like, a perspective, I guess, from all the women and what they said on how do we deal with the crisis that for us are so ur urgent, but they don't become mass media, you know? Yes, the rainforest is more sexy than humans. Yeah. Depends on the uh, uh, gatekeepers, right? It comes down to that statistic. Uh, you know, you, the people who allow certain things on air and commission certain stories, if they're all from the same background and they're all waiting for their turn to speak, which is why it's, you know, I want to hear more people speak. So <laughs> I'll pass. I think we have the last comment or question. Um, I really commend yourself, Jamie, and anyone who really tries to change the way that the media reports things because the way that the language that they use influences how the public and policymakers address the situation. And so I'm really curious um, some of the strategies for anyone really to shed light on how 
we can help, you know, shape, how we can sort of, not pressure, but, you know, get the media to understand that the way that they report a story um, is important. And I just am curious to hear how you've done it in the past. Um, I think to answer very quickly, one of the, the two biggest things was to form a coalition, you can't do it alone, make sure there are the victims who have been, like, at the forefront of that violence who can be in the meetings and work directly with journalists. Work, journalists understand the industry and how to speak to other journalists better than anybody. So kind of build that coalition and, and do it with others.